from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Sasha. I work here in the Library of Congress Young Reader Center, and I hope that you're enjoying your visit to the library so far. Who's been here before? Oh, good. And your first time then, the two of you. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. So we have a pop quiz for you guys, kind of. Um, pop quiz slash fun fact. How about that? Okay, so... In the Library of Congress, we have millions of things, okay? We have millions and millions of items. And of course, we have books. So do you know what other items we might have in the library's collections? Yeah. Fossils. What's that? Fossils. Fossils? Ooh, I think we do, yeah. Sculptures, for sure. Art. Art. <laughs> yeah, we have all kinds of photographs and artwork and prints and everything, yeah. We have so many old items from when back when. You saw the museum part, that's awesome, yeah. Journals, yeah, absolutely. We also have maps, five million maps, in fact, and a total of about 167 million things of all kinds. We even have flutes, we have a ton of flutes. We have really expensive violins, Stradivarius violins and uh, cello, so we have all kinds of stuff and we're gonna show you some of it as we talk to some scientists to celebrate women in science today. So I am really happy to introduce you guys to two scientists. And the first one's going to speak first, Dr. Svetlana Kotlerova. She ha ha got her PhD in human genetics from Tokyo University. And now she is a scientific review officer at NIH. Have you guys heard of NIH before? S stands for National Institutes of Health. And she'll tell you a little bit more about what kind of work she does there and how she got where she is now and what kind of work she's doing there. So how about we welcome Dr. K. Thank you very much for inviting me today. And thank you, Sasha, for introduction. Um, so it's a great honor to be here and to speak with you, our future. So, and I hope that I will um, infuse some excitement in, uh, into you about science. So everyone has science class? Yeah. yeah? So uh, you like science? That's great. That's great. So half of the job is done. <laughs> so um, actually, I forgot I wanted to start with saying good morning. Здравствуйте, доброе утро. This is good morning um, in Russian. Uh, and uh, as you already figured out, I came from Russia. So I was born in Ural Mountains in the uh, like kind of central um, or closer to, Mo to Moscow side of Russia. And um, everyone heard about Moscow, but maybe not so much about Russia. So I show you something about my hometown. So the city of Ufa is in the mountains, Ural Mountains, and we have a lot of nice, um, nature, no, a lot of nice pictures you can take there if you ever go. Uh, and um, this inspired me to learn more about uh, living things, about life science. And uh, this is the monument, very famous. It's the um, national hero of Bashkir people. So Ufa is capital of Bashkir Republic inside of Russia. And Bashkir are about 30% people who li live there. And they have their special national clothing. And uh, this is how it maybe looks now. Snow, there is still snow there. So, 
So these are some pictures from my childhood. So this is our very modest and old apartment building. This is where I grew. And um, this is my baby sister. And maybe you figure this is me. So how old are you guys? Twelve. Twelve. This is about me. This is me at your age. So, and this is, I'm wearing one of my dresses. I had two dresses. One was always need to wash, and another I was wearing. And um, uh, this is my school. I liked school very much. I went to there to meet my friends and great teachers who inspired me and who teach me all the good things that I can use in my life. And I'm thankful for everyone who uh, taught me all, all of this. And this is me helping my mom after school uh, drying clothes. So we didn't have a dryer. So actually it's not, it wasn't cultural thing in Russia. And maybe now some people will have it. And uh, we always just dry them outside. So why I'm telling you all this? Because regardless of your background, where you were born, if you have your dream, you follow your dream, and uh, you will do some things that you even couldn't imagine. So, for example, my parents were very much insisting on good education. They were born before the World War II, and they didn't have higher education, but they wanted for their kids to have it. And they put us into a school with special uh, emphasis on English language. But Russia was a very closed country. I never saw any of my relatives or friends going out to, to other countries. And I was asking myself, why I'm learning English? But then, standing in front of you today, I would say my parents were right. So they were enforcing something on me that I maybe didn't understand, but it helped me uh, through my life. So I, I suggest you listen to your parents. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had um, a lot of um, inspiration from my friends and teachers and support. Um, this is what you seek when you are going to pursue your dream. And um, so from Ufa, having interest in uh, science and more in life sciences, I went to Novosibirsk. It's in Siberia. It's very cold there, but it can be also very warm. It can be 100 degrees in summer, so, but it's dry. It feels different. So I was studying there uh, biology, molecular biology and biochemistry, and then it happened so I met my husband, Dr. Yuri Kotlerov, during my um, university years. And together with him, we went to uh, University of Tokyo in Japan uh, to study further and to get our PhD degrees. And I worked in the Brain Science Institute, and I will show you some brain cells later. And when we were in Japan, we had a chance to go to a conference to the United States. And we were so impressed by the scientists and by the opportunities that are in this country for the research. And um, we decided to work in the United States. So we moved and um, it was almost like round the world journey. <laughs> so, um, so I'm talking that I'm scientist, but what is really science? Can you guys s say something or write? Um, I think science is something that you can explain, but then later on you can explain it. 
to explain unexplained. That's very good. I think science is when you like have questions about the world and things that you find and then some, some stuff is never answered or things that are very questionable. That's very good. I and think science is something like a group of different things that have something to do with, like you wanted to um, study, um, what was it again? Uh, Molecular biology, biochemistry. Yes, and you could, it's also like astronomy. Yeah, and, that's right. Um, that's all great answers. Uh, science is the way we learn about the unknown things in the world and uh, it also includes all the knowledge gained through centuries and generations to, from, from generation to generation. And uh, scientists are using different tools. So here you see a couple of tools already. So any m more tools that so which, what kind of tools do you think scientists use? Just give me a couple examples. Yes, please. How did you know I'm going to speak about microscope? <laughs> so you guessed it right. <laughs> yes? Telescopes, all right. So what are microscopes used for? To see what kind of things? Tiny objects and telescope? Yes, that's right. Yes. Speakers. That's very good. Yes. 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 To measure exact and to mix things, right. So, and what do scientists do? How does science work? So, what does it start from? Like what, yes? Question of hypothesis, exactly. And then we do what to test the hypothesis? Experiments. Experiments. And uh, then we get something, result. Data, data. Exactly. And then we have to explain it. Is it the result we expected or is it something unexpected? Then what do, what do we do? So, and a very important thing is to get the resources to do all the experiments. So you need funding and we will talk about funding a little bit later. And before you start your experiment, do you want to know if this idea occurred to someone and someone already resolved this? Do you want to invent a new wheel? or you want to, to use the invented wheel and build a new, more big. So, you go to get more information, right? And now we have all the resources. We have the uh, computer, internet. We can check some ideas and find information. Where else we go to get information about ideas that you want to pursue, yes. Of course, and that's why we are here, right? And um, we talked about the tools and just from the first try that we're talking about the microscope. So when does m microscope, uh, when the people start thinking about microscope? Someone is thinking and sitting and saying, oh, I will invent a microscope, no? So, actually, there was no glass at, the, at first, and glass was invented. And then they saw, like, if they put some glass on some object, they see that it is it become bigger. And um, this was happening, like, in the first century. Uh, Romans noticed that. And then one scient uh, scientist or... Uh, uh, some guy in Italy uh, made the first mag magnification um, eyeglass just for one eye. 
to uh, help people to see. And after that, in two Dutch spectacle makers made the first mi microscope, which was a tube, which was like consisted of three tubes that were, you have to retract them. And uh, the first microscope that was used for many things was invented again by a Dutch uh, draper and scientist, Anton van Leeuwenhoek. So probably you heard his name because this is um, when the real microscopy started. So, and he was the first to see tiny creatures um, under the microscope. And uh, in 1665, Robert Hooke, an English scientist, published his um, micrographia, uh, the things that he observed under the microscope. And we will talk about this in a second. So as you can see, there are Romans, Italians, Dutch people, English scientists, and centuries. Uh, so in time and space, the microscope invention was continuing. So this is how science works. It is, a, uh, and now it is more like teamwork. Uh, people, people can move using planes, and helicopters, you name it, uh, to different areas to do research together. And uh, if you choose to be a scientist, you could be also traveling a lot. And, huh? Historian? Historian? Excavation or ar archaeologists, yes. So, and as we spoke about uh, Robert Hooke, uh, the Library of Congress has uh, his micrographia. So his drawing that he made looking into the microscope. And uh, this website actually is a great resource both for the students and for the teachers uh, to get acquainted to know more about different um, pieces or different information, different uh, information on scientific discoveries um, and so on. And uh, this is the micrographia that Robert Hooke made. So what did he draw? What did he look at the microscope? He looked at the cork cork, cork on the trees, the cork like on the oak. Mm -hmm. And um, he found some structures, he called them pores or cells. And he called them cells because he was thinking when looking at them that they rem reminded him cells of a monastery where monks lived, like tiny cells in a monastery. And guess what? He was the first person who named themselves. Since then, these uh, uh, units of life are called cells. Actually, he was seeing the dead cells and the walls of the cells. And this is how cork cells look under modern microscope. So he could draw very nicely. And this is the living cells of onion under microscope. Maybe you will do or already did this experiment in your school uh, looking at uh, onions. And this is the first microscope that was like a tube and Robert Hooke drew his micrographia using this microscope which he invented too. And this is how modern microscope looks which you are familiar with. And these are some of uh, my data that um, were published about the uh, brain tumor. So when I did the brain cancer studies. Uh, so as you can see, the shape of the cells 
is in green because there is protein that is in the cell membrane, uh, which is called beta-catenin, and the nucleus, which is uh, stained in blue. So now I want to tell you a little bit where scientists work. So it could be an academic institution or university, industry and government. And um, I work in the government organization, which is called National Institutes of Health. This is one of the biggest research institutions in the world. And it's right here in Bethesda. So it's just close to you. And you can be part of it. And we, we'll talk about this later. So there are many achievements that uh, were done at NIH, National Institute of Health, everyone calls it NIH. And uh, for example, discovery of fluoride to prevent the tooth decay or eradication of Ebola, as you heard recently. And um, human genome was also sequenced uh, at NIH. So there are 27 institute and scientific centers at NIH, and I work in the Center for Scientific Review. And what does it mean? We will know in a minute. So what do you think about scientific review? So we were talking about experiments, hypothesis, and what do we do with the results? And where, where does scientific uh, peer review have place? So there are some five options for you to guess what is scientific review? What is an IHP review? So, but I, I warn you, this is a tricky question. So, so who is for? Do you have any ideas? What is your idea? Um, if hmm? Two? Scientists meet together to discuss science. No, no, no. Three. Three? Scientists review scientific application from other scientists. Yeah, that's peer to peer. Very good. But two was also correct. And one is correct because science write application about the idea and submit it to NIH. Also, when scientists meet, they evaluate the um, application, how interesting it, it is, how it will improve, how it will advance science further. And they will give it a score. So four is correct too. And NIH is make sure that this process is all fair and only experts review the applications. And um, everything is done without bias and in a timely manner. So going back to this schema, so we were talking about funding and that we will talk about it later. So, and this is where the peer review comes into the picture. How to distribute the funding, government funding for research. So peer review makes sure that the most advanced and important scientific questions will be um, examined and this important knowledge will be available for the uh, whole population to advance health of the population and to eradicate the disease. And we need to make sure that the best science uh, will be um, promoted. So I suggest that you experience how peer review works just uh, now by doing this uh, small game. So we have three proposals that were submitted from some scientists. And um, the first proposal is smoking, is about smoking and lung cancer. So
So the scientists want to know how the cigarette smoking causes lung cancer and what chemicals are responsible for damaging biological molecules. So now you need to look at your badge that you have and see if any one of you has expertise to be a reviewer for this application. We, there will be, they will study chemicals and biological molecules. So any molecular biologist we have or any chemist, do, what do you have? Molecular biology? Okay, come here. Any lung cancer specialist? All right, on we have back. one on the back. <laughs> yeah, come here. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, any, uh, any chemist, chemistry, or general cancer research? Uh, we still have to have the third person for this number one. Any lung cancer, chemist, molecular biologist, or cancer, general cancer? You, you, what do you have? Okay, yeah, come here. Great. Yeah. And we have proposal number two about toothpaste and cavities. So the questions that they will study, which of the three chemicals is the best to protect your teeth? Is it sugar? Is it, uh, it sounds, sounds sweet, right? Sounds good. Uh, baking soda or fluoride? So we need some oral hygienist some dentist, De dentist, dentistry, perfect. Oral hygiene, come here. And uh, uh, again, some chemical expertise. We are talking about chemicals. No, no chemist. Everyone is bacteria. So this is one is for you. So. So someone need to pretend to be chemist, so. You want to be chemist? <laughs> okay, all right. And um, now uh, the third proposal. How do bacteria protect themselves from viruses? Do they synthesize <laughs> special molecules that help them to do so? So we have bacteriologists, virusologists, right? So now we have all these three different topics and we have, uh, so, okay. These stickers. So I give everyone a sticker and please, uh, if you think that the topic is important, Give it as three stickers. If you think, oh, it would be good to know, but I'm not very excited, give it two stickers. And if you think, mm, maybe better not to do this type of study, give it a one sticker, okay? And I have three boards for each of the proposal. So put your stickers on each one of them. So, okay. So we start from you, and I give you the stickers. So, to you, and to you. And then you need to put your board, to give your board to the next person. All right, we have 27 likes for bacteria and viruses. Uh, 24 for smoking and cancer. So what do we have for toothpaste? Less enthusiasm for toothpaste. <laughs> so I guess everyone figured it out already, that sugar, not so good. All right. <laughs> so this is just um, an example, um, just a game to give you an idea how peer review works like you scientists from different areas of science will gather together and decide 
which is the most exciting project and which will be beneficial uh, to uh, our nation. So, about importance of basic science. As you know, there is basic science and applied or clinical science, and you can easily figure out what clinical science means. It's just uh, immediately applicable to patients. But basic science is um, science that will answer many questions that are unknown, many questions about the disease that are not known. Maybe for those diseases without cure, such as cancer, we need to gather a lot of knowledge which probably will not be immediately introduced into clinic, but will be helpful in developing uh, such cure in the future. And basic science importance, um, you appreciate it very much, and I'm very happy. Uh, so let's talk about these viruses and bacteria. So w would you say uh, maybe to cure diabetes would be more important than to bacteria, uh, to know how bacteria protect themselves about the viruses. It happened that um, National Institute of Health and National Science Foundation funded the bacteria and viruses research. And what they find that bacteria will protect themselves against viruses by cutting pieces of DNA. And they found that uh, human DNA can be also cut, like piece of the human DNA, you can cut for example with the gene that has coding for insulin protein and then you put it into bacterial DNA so now you have the bacterial DNA which has human gene and it will synthesize human protein and then they purify protein and give it to patient. So this is um, how basic science can lead to cure. So you can be part of NIH too, and there are several programs that are available for high school students and for university uh, students. And uh, there are also a lot of resources Maybe Sasha can uh, email to your teacher these resources and um, you can investigate them when you're doing some projects. And there is a lot of interesting information about science. And if you are interested, if you have questions, uh, if you are patient, uh, anyone with these qualities can be scientist. And of course, you read books, you go to the library, don't forget Library of Congress. And uh, you can do science camp, you can do a lot of activities. And go to earn your degree. And there are some professions in biomedical research or biomedical science that do not require advanced degree. So for example, environmental field technicians, sonographers, or uh, veterinary technicians, nurse, uh, and if you are interested in doing forensic science, for example. So you still have to have education to do these things that you are interested, and uh, you can choose to pursue your academic career by going to a PhD studies and have your own lab and ask your own questions, apply for NIH for funding and do your research that you uh, would love to do. So just do not let your imagination to uh, give you boundaries. So dream big and follow your dreams. So to be a scientist. So uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation and uh, now Dr. Yuri will uh, <laughs> excite you. <laughs> okay.
And we will have questions maybe later yeah. together, right? Thank you very much. So our next scientist and um, the doctor, Yuri Kutlerov, is um, the other half of the scientific dynamic duo. And he'll talk to you a little bit about the kinds of works that he does with scientific data, what happens after you, you get the results of the experiments and the questions that you were asking. Um, so he got hit, he also went to Tokyo University, got a PhD in engineering, and now also works at the National Institutes of Health in the Center for Human Immunology. He's a staff scientist, so science is a daily thing. Uh, looking at a whole bunch of things and figuring out how everything fits together. So tell us a little bit more about your work. Okay. Hello, good morning again to you. So, first quick question I want to ask you. What do you think the most common tools now in science as it was for centuries? Like what scientists used to generate hypotheses, thinking about uh, the nature? What, 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 what is the tool? So Svetlana before talked talk with you about some scientific tools. So what, what do you think? Any ideas? Like very simple tools every, every scientist used for centuries. Yes? Magnifying glasses, but yeah, it was developed just uh, maybe few, maybe hundred years ago, something like this. Something was simpler. What scientists using? Water. Water. Okay, but not everyone, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. Paper and pencil. You have to write your <laughs> ideas. <laughs> And, and you, you, you kind of re recording your findings, right? So in last years, things change. What do we use now? So we also use pa pa and, pa and pencils and papers. So what we use now? Technology, what kind of technology? Internet. Internet, yes, but before? Uh, just com let's say computers, right, more general. The machines that help us to store like large amount of data and do the analysis. <laughs> Which machine? Computers, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, again, Svetlana recently described you that, that, that scientists who discovered my, my microscope, they just draw the, the, um, the pictures they saw under the microscope. Uh, and many thought and hypothesis was built about the, 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 the pictures. So what current technology is recording is very com 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 complicated. It's also images that converted to the data on the computer and, and it's large amount of data. Maybe I can just show you. So this is what, what, what one of technologies, it's a little bit old. Uh, we use the, 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 this called uh, my, DNA or name microarrays. You know all what is DNA and how it looks like, what is it? You, did you study in your science class? Uh, is this, this look, like, look like this, yeah, like a letter molecule that, that can uh, pass the information about you from generation to generation why we look like your mom and dad, and why we different from animals, from bacteria, because every living thing, they have DNA in their, in, in their cells. Uh, so these technologies has, it's actually a very tiny chip. It's about like one and a little bit more than s s s s s s s s centimeters. And they have small pieces of DNA attached to like every my, my Micron of, of, of this array, and it's a, the DNA is very different, and it's light when this, when it finds similar DNA in your sample. <coughs> so we analyze like a lot of thousands of such images. It's very complicated. It's written by laser, and basically when the laser uh, fi finds the, the the light, it means this gene also present in in, in your sample. The samples can be cells or you, you, you're from, from some, so something from your blood, from mouse animals, bacteria, and so on. So and the, 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 the data takes a lot of space, and it requires computer to do the analysis. For example, we can compare uh, 
cancer patients, some sample like blood sample from ca 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 cancer patient with a healthy patient, just normal, and see with, 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 with genes that are different. Maybe if some genes express more, it means the genes response in cancer patients is gene responsible for the cancer. Or if some genes uh, we find less in cancer patients, maybe this gene is important to protect healthy people from cancer. So, but the, yes? How can I uh, This is a complicated question. The, and it's actually it's under very large study now, how the cancer form there. It's, the, it's the, the problems that the different cancer is very different from one, if you compare one patient and another patient, even with the same type of cancer, let's say lung cancer, the, the nature of cause cancer may be very different. Some maybe smoked a lot and got the cancer. Another one maybe lived in different environment or had some genomic predisposition, um, some mutations in their cells. So it's very difficult question. And it's So yeah, there are some the, cancer. Yeah. Can I yeah, you answer? Can, you can answer? So, um, cancer is um, the although they are all different, as Yuri said. So there are common feature of all cancers that there something 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 happens in the uh, DNA in our genetic information that make the cells to divide uncontrollably. So we cannot stop dividing. That's the why the tumor is formed. So it's growing. That is the main feature um, uh, which is common to uh, many cancers. So um, is that what your question, how the cancer is formed? But exactly the mechanism can be different for all different types of cancer. And there are a lot of... And even, for example, if there is a brain cancer, there is a multiple d d d d different type, ty types of brain, brain, brain cancer. And it's different how people survive. Some survive longer, some survive less. Some people respond to, to some, some treatment some, and, uh, and, and, and survive longer. But other people do not respond. And it's very important to know uh, what is the right treatment for some patient and then for another. Um, may, 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 maybe you heard about some program like pre precision mm -hmm. medicine in, in, in initiative when scientists wants to really analyze like six, 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 six sequence of, of DNA in your cells and know more about you and to find better cure. Yes, the, the earlier the earlier cancer de 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 detected, the easier to 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 to, to treat it you, 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 usually. But it's, it depends on, on aggressiveness of cancer and uh, and it's it's sometimes it's very hard to find the cancer at early stage because the, the cells are very small, you know, and can, can cancer cells they're hiding. It's 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 very tough, and it's one of the direction of of can, can, cancer science to detect the cancer at the early stage. So, but I don't have much time. I want to have some fun with you about the data analysis in general. So I show you the slide just to have an idea that we're dealing with some large images that converted to the data on the computer. So, but I want to talk something different that maybe it's, you won't notice it's related to science. So in the Library of Congress, there is a very large database on the, of old newspapers. The newspapers was scanned and with optical character recognition technology. Have you heard about it? Basically, you can convert the image to the text. You heard, right? It's called o o o o OCR. So the Library of Con Congress holds this large database of newspapers from, you say, 18th century to, 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 to 20th centuries 
all the, so many, many newspapers and all the text is recognized on the computer like you, 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 you're, you're reading the, the news in the computer. So, and so this project, Chronicle in America, provides very good, good access to, to this data. And you can do some very fun, fun research, I, I would say. And I can just go with, with, with you and just do some very small analysis uh, in the, with, with the tool I'm using. So, you all like animals, dogs and cats. Who, anyone have dogs or cats in the morning? So, who is the dog people? Wow, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and who are cats people? You have both, right? So, very good. So, let's ask a question from 18th century, right? We have all these papers. And how many papers mention dogs and how many papers mention cats? So what people will prefer to talk about in newspaper? Yes? I think it's professional background. Okay, yeah, we, we, can, we can see. So <laughs> this actually, so I, I, my talk based on, uh, there is um, some data exploration like this in the Library of Congress uh, blog. I, I get the idea from, from there, but applied it on the tool with what, what I'm using. Okay, I will show you my, my screen here. Okay, so the, 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 this called environment called R Studio, and I'm using R language, just one letter R. Um, so I get, this is the link. Coding. It's a coding, yes. This is the how we, so I'm doing the data an analysis my, in my daily job. And this is basically coding. And so this is my code. This is where the, all the output show me. And this is where you will see some p, p pictures and variables. Any of you studied some kind of coding? You did? Good. But what language have you used? Uh, we, we use code to make video games. What, oh, I, I see. Oh, probably like a, um, Yes. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So this code, the, 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 this language, lang lang language is very used in the in, in, in the science for data analysis. So I will read this URL in the code, get some data. Um, I hope the internet works well. So you can see I'm I'm reading. Like um, some, I'm getting some pa papers from Arizona, and you can see that there is a 300,000 uh, mm, papers just from, from this state. So let's go to dogs. So we can, for example, so I'm doing the request for like for dogs and like just it, it will take a long time to analyze the whole uh, the database so I'm taking only first 20 pages and just to look it returns me so dog mentioned just in in in, in 20, 20 pages it's not newspaper pages but it's pages what Library of Congress give, 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 gives you and it's, you can see it, it's more, around 2 million, around 2 million, million records about the dogs. So, so here I, I get information for, for both uh, cats and dogs. So you can see it goes through, yep, through all the 20 pages of information and it's getting what, st what state the data from and how many mentioning of dogs and, and cats. Okay, 20, it's done. It it's actually will take a long time for to analyzing the whole database. So some preparation. Okay, and now we have a plot. So, can, can you see it? No. Well, so 
this show show by state uh, and make it a little bit smaller. Okay. So the red one is cats, the blue is dogs. So this show how many mentions from the newspaper from each state in the United States, again, from 18th century. Again, the more you, you, you can see, for example, Illinois, it looks like, like dogs more than cats. Here we are, the District of Columbia, cats wins. <laughs> and some of, so some of them, like New York is a dog state, Kentucky, California, but others, they're, they're pretty much cat, cats as well. So if we, <clears throat> if you do a little bit more plotting. So I calculated, like, who is the winner, basically, the ratio of number of dogs in newspaper divided by number of cats. So these green are the dogs winners state. You can see Kentucky is on the top. So basically more dogs than, than cats. Three, 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 three times more mention of dogs in Kentucky. This is the tie. Basically the same. In Virginia, South Dakota, and Georgia. And in Arizona, Montana, Indiana, they look like cats more. <laughs> okay, you all like Star Wars, right? <laughs> you, did you watch Last Jedi? No? Anyway, there is a database about all the characters from the Star Wars in all the movies, maybe main movies. So about their physical characteristics, I don't know who compiled them, but there is like whole website describing who is who. It's, it, and the, 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 this website basically have the easy access to all the data. For example, different planets, people, vehicles, spaceship, which people using which vehicle and, and so on, and which films they are and so on. This is the data how it look like. Some name of the person, you can see Darth Vader here, Anakin Skywalker, even droid, C-3PO, and, and, and the, this is just the first part. There's 88 characters total in, the, in this database, 39 attributes. So again, disclaimer, last movie now is The Force Awakens, no last Jedi yet. <laughs> but, and you can see the, there is the height and mass and hair color, eye color, and gender, and where they're from, what the species, and so on. <laughs> so I just thought it would be some kind of fun to do data analysis of this, uh, this database, just quickly. So I already collected the data. So I'll just read them. Some libraries. So this can give me some ideas about what species are in the movie. So there is 37 humans, five droids, and then others, just so many species in the galaxy that very, that, that, that with very, very, very few represent, representatives of each. Yes, and this movie mostly about humans, you know. Um, let's, so they have, mass and height, and I thought let's plot them uh, uh, again each other. So here are some points. So this is the mass of so how he he heavy they are, and this is height. So again, this is the maybe. So th 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 this show, everyone that has both mass and height. So you can see they're kind of on the line. So the heavier the character, the higher they are, or opposite. There is one exception here. So it's very heavy and not very, very high. Any ideas who can be, who knows the movies? Uh, there is the Jabba the Hutt, remember this fat guy? <laughs> bad, bad guy. So for this, I only leave human and droids. So let me label them. So 
This is a BB-8, very small droid. And then the top we have Darth Vader, very very higher than all the all the uh, other humans, with uh, with with another droid, like kill, kill, killer droid. And then basically all the humans are kind of, there is a line with some exceptions. <laughs> so you know idea about the body mass index, uh -huh. how they how doctors kind of assess <laughs> how healthy you are based on mass and height. Yes. So or if, if like your BMI is basically mass divided by square of your height, 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 mm -hmm. sorry, height. <laughs> so I can cal calculate the um, BMI, BMI <laughs> uh, for these characters. Okay, so this is this is coloring male, female. Ah, it's okay. Uh, this is so again here with the, the green one. It's a health, health, healthy zone. You can see this is between like 20 and 25. It's usually healthy BMI, and you see all the humans are pretty good shape. Uh, let me let me label how them about, also. How about Chewbacca? <laughs> let me label them. Actually, he was there, but he is not human. He was excluded. Oh, okay. Uh, so, see, Darth Vader a little bit overweighted, but he probably has a lot of metal in the body. <laughs> Some few people are overweight. And this, I remember, uh, the Luke's, Luke's uh, ste stepfather, right? He's a little bit overweighted. And one of the pilot folks with nickname. <laughs> Piggy, Jack from the Paul Hawkins. So all the females here, here, except one, Captain Phasma from The Force Awakens. So it's a very large woman. So, and you know, this is the wartime. They all like very fit to fight. And also it's Hollywood actors. You know, they're supposed <laughs> to be healthy. <laughs> so. Okay, so I want to finalize. We don't have my, my, much time. I have to have some other very fun data sets. Um, but I want you to have an idea that it's very easy to use computer and with just a few lines of code, you can, you can look at it from the different prospects on your data and kind of get an idea. Uh, and generate some hypotheses for for further experiments. Thank, 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 thank you very much, guys, for listening. Oh, uh, yeah. If you have quick, quick questions. Yeah. So you you do research. You um, analyze data. Analyze data, but not this, of course. This, right, this right, is just right. for fun in my free time. Right. So, <laughs> what type of data? So you're only. Uh, analyzing immunology data or are you analyzing all the different data that I'm comes analyzing into your different office? data which are related to immunology. Okay. It can be some like autoimmune diseases. It can be, for example, we published a large paper about the flu vaccination. Okay. How people respond to, 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 to flu vaccine. But we see that it depends on some cells in your body. Some people respond uh, higher than others. Okay. And we find some cells that actually they're Stay the, 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 the amount of those cells just before the vaccination can is responsible for whether you will have response or not. Okay. So, and it's very d different how young people respond versus old people. We have very kind of d d different immune system, and it's, we're still trying to understand what's the, di the like big difference between young and old people. And you did so we study. Yes. You did yeah, there, cancer too. That's right. We need. Do you um, all ever get to work together? We used to work together oh, okay. for eight years in the, can in the cancer lab on okay. the brain cancers. So I'm uh, whispering that you did cancer analysis too. <laughs> cancer <laughs> yeah, data. Before. Yes, yeah, we, we working on the, yeah, And now, you know, the, in the cancer research, the immunotherapy is very promising mm -hmm. to, 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 to prepare the, the, the cell that is specific for, for a patient that will help him to fight the cancer and then attack the cancer cells and kill them. 
So this is very promising research. And, in, and also in, in, in immunology, in general immunology, there is many, many open questions that we are trying to answer. Basically, my job is to help scientists to understand their data and to generate some new hypotheses. Uh, what, how, how to explain what we see in the data. Do you have any questions, guys? But basically, they, they, this is using the tools that now almost everyone has. Many, 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 many people have computers in their home. This is free tool. And, and yeah. this, yeah, this, this tool I'm using is actually free. It's open source. Would you yeah. rather use the computer or like a like pencil and paper? Like because <laughs> say if like all the power went out, and then course, your data yeah. will be erased. Of course. Uh, yeah, I prefer to use the computer when it's available. But we should be ready, of course, and just don't lose the skills to write, to write and and draw with a pen and pen and pencils. We, we actually have a whole bunch of research in the Library of Congress collection, digital collections of Thomas Jefferson writing down data with paper and pencil, and he was trying to figure out, not necessarily even figuring out, just recording data about the weather every day, and yeah. <laughs> he would write down just everything that he saw around him, and then you can see all that data online, and you could also plug it into a computer and analyze what Thomas Jefferson was looking at every day. So. He was a writer, inventor, scientist, library, enthusiast, everything. <laughs> but I, I, I can say that you saw the op optical character recognition from the newspapers when the font is very fixed and we know how the letters look like. But when you have the handwriting uh, and you want to actually computer to analyze what's written, it's a very hard task. Because different people have different you know, writing styles and sometimes it's, you even cannot read <laughs> and you want computer to be able to read. But there is a technology with like uh, some deep learning and neural networks that, that, that can help with this. And now there is, the research is ongoing in this area. All right, well, how about another round of applause for our scientists there? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation and make sure to check out the digital resources we have about all these founding fathers who recorded their data and the original scientists. And there are so many sources out there. I feel like you can find a lot of really interesting data and explore if you have a question, you're already a scientist and just Keep exploring your curiosity, okay? All right, guys, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.